Stepping on the Cracks by Mary Downing Hahn, Chapter 5. That evening, while Mother and I washed the dishes, I stared at the open kitchen window. The summer dusk was deepening into night, and lightning bugs flickered in the holly trees. But all I could think of was the crazy man. Somewhere in the woods, just across the railroad tracks, he prowled the darkness, knife in hand, looking for a victim. Bending my head over the glass I was drying, I asked Mother if she'd ever heard of any strange rumors about the experimental farm. She shook her head. The university tests fertilizers and works on cures for animal diseases, she said. Things like that. Why? Gory Smith says a crazy man escaped from there, I told her. He was an experiment that went wrong or something, and he's hiding in the woods. He has a knife this big. To show her, I held my hands apart the way Gordy had. Mother laughed. Why, Margaret, I hope you don't believe that. Those woods aren't big enough for someone to hide in. But I started to date started to say I'd seen him when I remembered I wasn't allowed to cross the train tracks. If I told Mother any more, she'd know I'd disobeyed a major rule, one she'd insisted on since I learned to walk. No buts, Mother said. Gordy was pulling your leg. Nobody's down in those woods, except maybe an old tramp. Now dry the silverware so we can finish in time to hear the Lone Ranger. In the living room, safe beside Mother on the couch, I tried to convince myself I hadn't seen anything in the woods but a trick of shadow and sunlight. Gordy had made me think something was there. That was all. But after the Lone Ranger and his faithful Indian companion rounded up a gang of outlaws and galloped off into the sunset, I stalled for time, begging to stay up longer. When I had listened to two more shows, Daddy, Daddy finally lost his patience and ordered me to bed. Reluctantly, I left the living room and climbed the steps to, Jim, to my room. Pausing in the hall, I glanced at Jimmy's closed door. If you were home, I wouldn't be scared, I whispered. You wouldn't let anybody hurt me. You'd take care of me. But Jimmy wasn't here to keep me safe. It was dark in his room and dark outside, and I was all alone upstairs. With tears pricking at the backs of my eyes, I went into my room and shut the door. Then, as an extra precaution, I shoved a chair against it. No matter what Elizabeth or Mother said, I'd seen the crazy man. It hadn't been my imagination. He'd been there, just for a second, staring at me. Then he disappeared. For the next couple days, I was very cautious when I left the house. The crazy man might be just ahead, hiding behind a tree or lurking around a corner. He might be sneaking up behind me. He might be lying in wait anywhere in College Hill. To be on the safe side, I stayed away from the train tracks and spent a lot of time looking over my shoulder. Elizabeth knew what was bothering me, and she teased me for being such a sissy baby. As far as she was concerned, I had fallen for one of Gordy's stories a lie he'd made up to keep us away from his hut. It hurt my feelings when she laughed at me and made chicken sounds, but all her teasing couldn't make me disbelieve what I'd seen in the woods. By the end of the week, I hadn't caught even a glimpse of the crazy man. Not in the daytime, not in the nighttime either. I began to think Elizabeth might be right after all. Maybe I'd only seen a harmless old tramp. Maybe nobody was going to get me. Maybe I was safe. <coughs> One hot afternoon, Elizabeth and I were slouched on the glider on her front porch, drinking ginger ale and looking at life. The big news was the liberation of Paris, and we were poring over pictures of the parade on the Champs-Élysées, searching for Jimmy's face among the hundreds of GIs. I didn't know if he was anywhere near Paris, but I was thinking it would be nice for him to march down the street and get a kiss from a pretty French girl. While I was imagining the good time Jimmy might be having in Paris, Elizabeth nudged me. Look, there's Barbara and Brent. Hearing Elizabeth shout hello, Barbara stopped and waved at us. The sunlight touched her dark hair with red fire as she bent down to smile at the baby in the carriage she was pushing. Abandoning the magazine, Elizabeth leapt off the top step and ran down the sidewalk with me at her heels. As I leaned into the carriage to tickle Brent, I heard her screen door shut. Looking over my shoulder, I saw a mother coming toward us. I just had to see Brent, she told Barbara. Pleased to have an audience, Brent cooed and bounced up and down. He was the sort of baby who loved everybody and expected everybody to love him. What a darling, Mother said. How old is he now? Five months today, Barbara said. He's big for his age, just like his daddy was. Maybe he'll grow up to be a football player, too. He reminds me so much of Butch, Mother said, especially when he smiles. Barbara smoothed, Brent, Barbara smoothed Brent's hair. I wish Butch would have seen him. He'd be so proud to know he had such a handsome son. 
Mother put an arm around Barbara's shoulder and hugged her. He'd be proud of you too, she said softly. You've been such a brave girl. Releasing Barbara, Mother reached into the carriage and scooped up Brent. Jiggity, jiggity, jig, to market, to market, to buy a fat pig, she sang as she bounced him on her hip. Brent squealed happily. His rosy face creased into a big smile, and he grabbed Mother's nose. You little rascal, Mother laughed and turned to Barbara. It seems like yesterday Jimmy was this size. I don't know where the time goes. When they're babies, you think they'll never walk or talk or do anything but eat and cry. And then in a minute, they're grown up and gone. How is Jimmy? Barbara asked. Have you heard from him lately? He's all right, I guess, Mother said. In his last letter, he sounded a little blue. I keep hoping he'll be home soon, but the war just drags on and on. Barbara bit her lip and looked across the street. Mrs. Bedford was hanging sheets out to dry in the backyard, and she waved when she saw us. Nobody said anything for a few seconds, so I poked my face close to Brent, hoping he'd grab my nose and make us all laugh again. I didn't want to think about Butch going off to war and getting killed in Italy three months after he married Barbara. He'd been my hero, the best quarterback on the high school team. If Butch could die, no one was safe. Reluctantly, Mother lowered Brent into his carriage, giving Barbara another big hug. She said, he's a wonderful baby. You're doing a great job. Then she looked at me. Don't you wander off, Mother said. I'll need some help with dinner in about an hour. We're going to walk Barbara home, Elizabeth said. Is that okay? Mother nodded. Just come straight back. No dilly-dallying, Margaret. Smiling at Barbara, she said, say hi to your folks for me. Barbara pushed the carriage slowly up Garfield Road, and Elizabeth and I walked along beside her. At the corner, Barbara, Barbara stopped for a moment to wait for a car to pass. Turning to Elizabeth, she asked, how's Joe doing? Fine, Elizabeth said. He can't tell us exactly where he is, but he said his ship hasn't seen much action. Mother says there are worse things than boredom. At least he's not being shot at. A squeal from Brent interrupted Elizabeth as she leaned over the carriage to make a silly face. I saw Gordy and Toad trudging toward us, hauling a wagon heaped high with tin cans, hubcaps, and old newspapers and magazines. Doug walked by its side, trying to keep everything from sliding off into the road. Wow, look at all that scrap they've collected, Barbara said. Ignoring Elizabeth and me, Gordy grinned at Barbara. He was wearing his old army helmet, and he was even dirtier than usual. His legs and arms were crisscrossed with briar scratches and scabbed with mosquito bites, and his skin was grimy. I bet you never saw anybody get more stuff than this, he said. Toad and Doug and me know all the best houses. Elizabeth nudged me. They probably stole it, she whispered. You're really doing your part, Barbara said, and Gordy grinned even more widely. Donald's doing his part too, Gordy boasted. He's a gunner now, shooting down Nazis. He demonstrated by pointing an imaginary machine gun at the sky and making his usual sound effects. How about Stuart? Barbara asked. Is he still in basic training or is he overseas already? Gordy hesitated a moment. Stuart's fine. Turning to Toad, he said, let's get this stuff to my house before we lose it all. Well, send your brothers my love, Barbara said, and tell Stu I miss him. Gordy didn't answer. Without looking at any of us, he yanked at the wagon and Doug moved quickly to steady its load. Barbara watched the boys disappear around a corner. That poor kid looks so neglected, she said. When Stu was around, Gordy had somebody to look after him, but now he's got nobody. He has his parents, doesn't he? Elizabeth scowled at Gordy's back. I sure wouldn't waste my breath worrying about him. Believe you me, Gordy Smith can take care of himself. I hope so. Barbara smiled down at Brent. Let's go home, little fellow, she whispered. It's almost time for supper. Elizabeth and I walked back from Barbara's house along the trolley tracks. The afternoon sun was still hot, and the steel rails shone like silver. I tried balancing on one, but the metal scorched the soles of my bare feet, and I hopped off. Not Elizabeth. Like a tightrope walker, she strode ahead of me. If she had a mind to, I thought she could probably walk on hot coals. When we reached Garfield Road, we left the tracks and turned toward home. Remember when Barbara and Butch got married? Elizabeth asked me. We sat on the curb and watched them come out of St. Andrews, and everybody threw rice. Barbara was the most beautiful bride I ever saw. And Butch was so handsome. I walked along silently, thinking about the wedding, feeling sad about Butch, wishing he hadn't died. 
Gordy sure didn't say much about Stuart, Elizabeth said after a while. Maybe he hasn't had a chance to shoot down any Nazis yet. Maybe not. We were standing in front of Elizabeth's house, a mirror image of mine, identical blue stars hung in our living room windows. With all my heart, I hope neither Elizabeth nor I would ever have gold stars. Step on a crack, Elizabeth shouted as she ran up her sidewalk. Break Hitler's back, I yelled, jumping hard on the cement. Then, taking the steps two at a time, I dashed inside, just in time to help mother set the table. Chapter 6 On the first day of school, Elizabeth raced up my back steps and pressed her face against the screen door. Haven't you finished breakfast yet? She asked me. I slurped the sugary milk left in my cereal bowl and ran into the bathroom to brush my teeth. Because it was a special occasion, Mother had insisted on rolling my hair up on rags to make it curl. But the humid September weather was already straightening it, and it hung way down my back, hot and heavy. Mother should have listened to me and let me wear braids, I thought glumly. You look nice, Elizabeth told me as we left the house. I like your dress. Thanks, I said, glad I'd worn my new one. It was dark gray plaid, and it had a round white collar. I like yours, too. Elizabeth smiled and smoothed her skirt. Her dress was as blue as her eyes, smocked across the bodice, and tied at the back with a sash. Its white collar and cuffs were trimmed with dainty lace. On her feet were brand new saddle oxfords, spotlessly white and shiny brown, and her socks stood straight up, hugging her legs. Unlike mine, they never slid down. How about my shoes? I scowled at my feet. I'd wanted saddles like Elizabeth's, but all the store had in my size were plain brown oxfords. They looked like army shoes, and after a summer of going barefoot, they felt stiff and tight. Elizabeth glanced down and shrugged. They're not so bad, she said. Lots of other kids will be wearing them, and they'll hate them just as much as you do. We walked up Garfield Road and met Polly Anderson on the corner. Sixth grade at last, she said. Now we're number one, the bosses of the whole school. Hooray for us, Elizabeth shouted. Judy Katz and Linda Becker yelled when they saw us, and we waited for them at the trolley tracks. Linking arms, we walked up the street together. I was glad to see Polly and Judy were wearing Oxfords like mine. Linda had saddles, but hers were black and white, not as pretty as Elizabeth's. Are you ready for Mrs. Wagner? Linda asked me. Nobody's ready for her, Elizabeth answered for me. She's so mean. She yells and makes you stay after school. And if she catches you talking, she sends you out in the hall. Just like that, Elizabeth snapped her fingers. And she loads you down with homework, Judy said. My big sister had her, and she told me I'd better watch out. My brother Paul was in her class last year, Polly said. He got hit lots of times with the ruler. Mrs. Wagner hated him. That's nothing new, Elizabeth said. Everybody hates Paul. I glanced at Polly, but she didn't look the least bit offended by Elizabeth's opinion of her brother. In fact, she nodded her head in agreement. There's somebody I hate even worse than Paul, Elizabeth nudged me and pointed across the playground at Gordy, slouching along with Doug and Toad. The three musketeers, Judy said scornfully. What dopes? Come on, Polly said. The bell's about to ring. I'll be late on the first day of school. As we hurried up the front steps, Gordy ran past me. The crazy man's coming, he hissed in my ear. He's going to cut your heart out and eat it for dinner, magpie. Startled, I stopped and stared at him. Too scared to move, Gordy made a hideous face and leapt at me, waving his arms and gibbering like a monkey. Get away from her, you dumbo. Elizabeth shoved Gordy, but he grabbed her hands. Help, help, Gordy yelled, pretending he couldn't escape. Lizard's throwing herself at me again. As Elizabeth broke free, Gordy dashed into school and ran to the boys' room. You can't get me now, Lizard, he said before the door swung shut. I despise Gordy Smith, Elizabeth told me. Her face was red and she was breathing hard. I loathe, abhor, detest, and utterly hate him. It didn't take us long to know why everybody had warned us about Mrs. Wagner. Short and plump, she strode grimly into the classroom and opened her roll book. Say present when your name is called, she said. She didn't smile like Miss Carter or speak softly like Mrs. Harper. In fact, when she reached Polly's name, she frowned. I hope you're not like your brother, she said. Passing over me with nothing more than a comment about Jimmy's artistic skills, Mrs. Wagner paused at Elizabeth's name and said, 
You'd better be prepared to work hard this year. From the sharp-eyed look she gave her, you could tell she wasn't about to be taken in by the big blue eyes and a pretty smile. She must have heard something about Elizabeth and obviously planned to keep an eye on her. After singling out Gordy, Doug, Doug, and Toad for some warnings, she told us to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and the Lord's Prayer. When we'd finished, we sat down and folded our hands on our desks while Mrs. Rag Wagner told us her rules. There will be no talking unless you are called on, she said. There will be no note passing. Neatness will count. So will spelling, grammar, and punctuation. Homework will be done on time, and there will be a great deal of it. There will be no tale telling. I will see everything that goes on in this room, and I will not need the misguided assistance of any child. As Mrs. Wagner paused to take a breath, I glanced at Gordy. He made a hideous crazy man face and drew a finger like a knife across his throat. Nervously, I looked at Mrs. Wagner. Had she seen Gordy and me? I keep those who misbehave after school, she said. Her eyes lingered on Gordy before moving on to the rest of the class. It is not a pleasant experience. Then, clearing her throat loudly, Mrs. Wagner plunged her hand into the pillowy bosom of her dress, rummaged around, and pulled forth a frilly handkerchief. Then, she blew her nose so loudly I expected an elephant to stampede through the classroom. No one giggled, not even Elizabeth. I am scrupulously fair, Mrs. Wagner continued. I have no favorites. Here, her eyes lingered on Bonnie Granham, Julie Ryan, and Phyllis Fields, the most stuck-up girls in school, and teacher's pets, all three. Only Phyllis blushed. Bonnie and Juliet sat and stared at Mrs. Wagner, their faces as hard as stone. In the silence following her words, Mrs. Wagner handed out her books, and lessons began. Math, spelling, geography, social studies, reading. Mrs. Wagner drilled us as though I'd never been drilled before. It was going to be a long, hard year. At 3.30, we raced across the playground, glad to be free. As soon as we were out of sight of the school, Elizabeth pretended to pull a handkerchief out of her dress. After groping around in an exaggerated imitation of Mrs. Wagner, she made a loud trumpeting sound. I have no favorites, she proclaimed. I hate all of you exactly the same, and I will be scrupulously unfair to each and every one of you. I keep those who misbehave in a special dungeon under the school. You will be chained to the wall and fed bread and water. Some of you will be shot at dawn. It will not be a pleasant experience, but I hope to give it to all of you, especially Elizabeth, Polly, Gordy, Doug, and Toad. We all laughed, but I swore to myself I would do my homework, even math, and be very careful with my commas and periods, as well as my spelling. This year, I would not read library books in my lap when I was supposed to be doing geography. I would pay attention instead of daydreaming. I would draw only when we were having art. I would talk only when I was called on, and I would never tell tales on anyone. No matter what I saw, I would keep my mouth shut and stay in Mrs. Wagner's good graces.